Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. And a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. My name is Mark Oakley, and I'm the Chancellor here at St Paul's Cathedral. And this is a very important evening for us at St Paul's Institute as we are launching a programme that has been in preparation for over 18 months. Like many of you, uh, we've been struggling to consider how to react constructively to the current feelings in much of the West, which finds itself in a crisis of identity, democracy, and globalization. Populism has captured the imagination of people who feel that their governments are not representing their interests. Isolation, division, and inequality in our country leave many people feel, feeling powerless, spectators, of political processes that seem detached from the concerns of everyday life. And whether it is Brexit or overseas conflicts, inequality of income or the housing crisis, globalization or environmental challenges, the impact of techno technological change on society or individual mental health, we can feel overwhelmed by what's around us. And yet there is also a stirring of goodwill and a growing sense that we can do better with many people rising to that challenge. We do not have to accept the way things are. There are alternatives and the growing willingness to explore them is surely a source of enormous hope. When things seem to be getting worse, it's an opportunity to reestablish what is truly important. As individuals, it's not what we have that matters, but how we use it for the whole. At the national level, it is about how we use markets and government to serve everyone. We need, of course, to work together to empower all members of society to have a voice in making decisions about a shared future. And more important still, we need a vision for our common life that tr transcends what we own and what we do, and prioritizes what we value and how we want to live together. And why all this at St. Paul's? Well, St. Paul's is obviously a place of Christian worship. You can still smell the incense from the evening service. And it has a long tradition of taking learning seriously. For centuries, it has been a place of public debate a place that believes in the power of words, ideas, and the human will to work together for constructive change. We try to do this in a spirit of hospitality that welcomes people of all faiths and none to come together and be inspired by each other to promote the things that matter for our shared humanity. And in much the same vein, the Archbishop of Canterbury has recently published a book entitled Reimagining Britain, Foundations for Hope. In it, he writes that the common good is the sharpest and most uncomfortable challenge to our financially centered society. Together, this event, the Archbishop's book, and the events and conversations that will come about are intended to encourage people to discover both the power and the imagination we have to have to rise to the challenge. In addition to welcoming each and every one of you, and before I welcome our main speaker, I need to make an apology for Professor Fran Tonkis, who appears in your program, but sadly who's not well and cannot be with us. We wish her a very speedy recovery. So I am absolutely delighted to welcome our main speaker for this launch, Professor Michael Sandell, who is here on a return engagement, having last spoken here at St. Paul's in 2012. You have a full biography of Professor Sandell in your programs. I will say only that Michael Sandell teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. He's been described as the most relevant living philosopher a rock star moralist, and currently the most popular professor in the world. In this country, 
He has, of course, delivered the BBC Wreath Lectures and currently his BBC series, The Public Philosopher, which explores the ethical issues lying behind the headlines with participants from over 30 countries. And that's why we have young people from many different walks of life on the stage with him. Tonight's event is slightly unusual for St Paul's Institute and the Cathedral, as we're simultaneously holding an event and recording it for a BBC Radio 4 episode of the Public Philosopher programme, which will be broadcast at 9am and 9.30pm on March the 27th. It will also be available on iPlayer or as a podcast. We will try to make this as seamless as possible, but as you are effectively watching a recording, occasionally our speaker may have to make some comments for the use on the recording over and above what he's saying to you, or do a slight retake. Mobile phone roaming can interfere with the recording, so please would you be kind enough now to turn yours off or to put it onto aeroplane mode. Offenders will be asked to, to stand in the corner for 15 minutes with their hands on their heads. So the evening will run as follows. Michael will debate with those on stage and with Dr. Graham Tomlin, who is the Bishop of Kensington, whom we are also very delighted to welcome here tonight. Michael will also talk with people in the front of the audience and at the end, after the event, there will be books for sale and a signing at a book table up here by the stage. So, would you please now join me in welcoming Professor Michael Sandel. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Michael Sandel. Welcome to this episode of The Public Philosopher. This time, we come to you from St. Paul's Cathedral, a magnificent sacred space that is also a remarkable place of civic gathering and deliberation. Our question is one of the hardest questions of contemporary politics. What has become of the common good? After decades of globalization and rising inequality, have we lost sight of what it means to be a citizen? Prime Minister Theresa May has suggested as much. Too many people in positions of power, she said, behave as though they have more in common with international elites than with people down the road. If you believe you're a citizen of the world, she said, you're a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what the very word citizenship means. Well, what does citizenship mean? What do we owe one another as citizens? And what are the competing conceptions of community to which the common good refers? To explore these questions, we have gathered here on the stage of St. Paul's Cathedral under the magnificent dome, a group of about 80 university students. I'd like to begin by putting to them the following question about a recent development in Germany. In Essen, Germany, there is a food bank. It's a charity. And the demand for the services of the food bank were very high. The food bank decided to deal with the very high level of demand by saying that priority would be given to Germans, to needy Germans, over needy foreigners and refugees. This prompted debate within Germany 
And it's a question I'd like to put to our students here on the stage at St. Paul's. What's the right thing to do? Was it right or wrong for the German food bank to give preference to Germans over foreigners? How many, let's first begin by taking a survey by the show of hands. And I'd like to take the survey on the stage as well as in the audience. How many think it was right for the German food bank to give preference to needy Germans over foreigners? Raise your hand. A small handful of people. How many think it was wrong? Both on the stage and in the audience in St. Paul's, the overwhelming majority have raised their hands saying it's wrong. Let's begin with someone who thinks it's wrong. Why is it wrong to give preference for the German food bank to give preference to needy Germans? Why is that wrong? Yes, tell us your name. We'll get you a microphone. Tell us your name again. Um, my name's Nimra. Um, I think it's wrong because it's given power to one nationality over another nationality, um, and it's determined that one particular identity is worth more than another. Who else thinks it's wrong? Thank you for that. Who else thinks it's wrong? Yes, and tell us your name. Hi, my name's Moiwa. Yeah, going on from that point, I just, I'm not really comfortable with Germans as well, saying they feel superior to people. I think there needs to be more in that conversation. <laughs> Do you think by giving preference to needy Germans, they are saying that Germans are superior as a people? Um, they are saying they deserve priority. Yes. And considering the historical context, a little bit uncomfortable with it. Who else? How did, how did you vote? You think it's wrong? Well, I didn't actually vote. My name's Delphine. Um, I think it's actually uh, reductionist to say it's wrong or right. I think what you need to remember is that the nation state if you were running, If you were running the food bank, what policy would you take? Well, I think it's more a case of obviously helping those in need who actually need it regardless of nationality. But the nation state, including any institution within it, will protect its own sovereign nationals. Should it? That's a different question. Well, that's our question. <laughs> yes. What do you say? I think that there are people who could be foreigners that need it more. So I would give priority for those who are in more need, even if they're not Germans. So the test, and what's your name? Constanza. Constanza. Constanza? Uh-huh. Your test, if you ran the food bank, you would try to determine of the people queued up for help who are the hungriest? Yes, who are the hungriest, the most needy. The most needy? Yes. Regardless of nationality. Right. Uh, those of you who's, who think it's wrong to give preference in the German food bank to Germans, is that how you would decide, based on need? Yes? All right, let's hear now from someone who said that it was right for the German food bank to give preference to needy Germans over others. You've heard the arguments against. How would you reply? Yes. Hi, uh, my name's Mohammed, and I, I get the idea of, you know, give it to those in need, and that's who needs it most. And in theory, that works. But I think there seems to be a pressure against nations protecting itself when it's intrinsically the most human thing to do. As much as we want to be unnecessarily good and not necessarily benevolent, if I, for example, if I have a family and I have food, do I give it to my son or do I give it to a homeless guy out there? Technically, he needs it more. My son has eaten like three times a day. It's not wrong for someone to do that in their family, so I don't really see why it's wrong for a nation to do it to themselves. If you have finite resources, I can understand why you'd want to give it to your own people because it's, it's the most human thing to do. Whether that's right or wrong All right. can it's, be argued against. It's, your name is? Mohammed. Mohammed says, think of the analogy of a family. If your child were 
hungry. And somebody, some stranger's child, was even hungrier. Would it be wrong to feed your own child? That's a pretty powerful challenge. Who has a reply to that? Yes. Hi, thanks. My name is Jacqueline. I think um, something that we need to recognize is that Germany has allowed, has accommodated people, given them the right to live in Germany that aren't Germans. So think of EU nationals. Do they not deserve to, um, uh, the support of the community through the food bank? So, so long as Germany lets them in, in the first place, they have to treat them on a par at the food bank with other Germans, what do you say? Hi, my name is Ramsey. <clears throat> um, I think on top of that, it largely depends on the influences which, for example, Germany may have had on those people. So in, for example, a family, if the father um, decided to um, kill the, the father of another child in another family who ends up being needy, the priority may end up in feeding that child before his own because he's had an influence on that family and so his obligation may, may alter. And so in terms of journey, Germany, if they've influenced other nations, then arguably that might justify them um, having to balance the, the system out in terms of giving to all needy. So if, this, if the refugees are Syrian refugees, as many are in this community of Essen, uh, if Germany is implicated in the conditions that led the Syrians to flee their country, they have to look after them. Is that the idea? That's, 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 that's one idea. That's, my, yeah, that's the idea I'm trying to say. And if not, if they simply ad admitted refugees whose condition they didn't contribute to creating? Then... It, it, it depends how far back you can kind of track it. So, at least in this example, then I would say that Germany, as a Western power, as a power that has a role in the wider international community, they have an obligation, um, and they've influenced the dynamic which exists now in Syria, and so the refugees fall under their obligation in that light. But only if the country is implicated in creating the conditions Yes. Does it need to treat them as equals to its own citizens? Sure. Yes. Hello, my name is Ute from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it is very dangerous in the context of Germany to talk about um, racial issues to decide who we give something to and who we don't. If we take the analogy of the family, are we a family in Germany or are we a family as human beings? And any other human being who is in front of us is our brother or sister. And so I think especially in Germany with an upcoming very strong right populism wing, we should be careful of dividing people in races. So you, you reject the analogy of nations to families. You reject the analogy of nations to families. The relevant family yes. here I is, is I the family of humanity, you think? Yeah, I, I agree with the analogy, but not with the definition of who is my brother and my sister, or my mother or my father. And the answer to that question is not my fellow German, but my fellow human being? Yeah, I think we, as soon as we have someone in front of us, who needs help, it is our brother and sister. So German or not German is not what matters. Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, especially in German. And I think we have a lot of experience in doing it wrong. Could, could I press you on this for the follow-up? Could you help a bit? Pardon? Could, could I press you a little bit on this? Yeah, go ahead. Suppose we weren't talking about a food bank. Suppose we were talking about benefits, welfare payments by the state. Should the German state, or let's talk about Britain, should the British taxpayers allocate benefits on the basis of human need or on the basis of who is a British citizen?
I think that it depends on the kind of benefits and that we would have to define allocation mechanisms which are fair to, in general, fair. Basic income support for poor people, let's say. As long as this person is in Britain on a legal basis, or even on an illegal basis, if that person is about to die, then I think there should be support. But the question is, benefits for British people, many receive that over, over years. And I'm not saying that we don't need to solve the refugee crisis and find mechanisms right. of making those people maybe return or have a better condition or not have benefits anymore because they get integrated, they get educated, they take on jobs and pay taxes themselves. Who would like to take on the example of benefits? Now, moving beyond the food bank, does, let's, actually, let's, let's take a vote on this one to see what, whether people have a different view. Basic income support for the poor, a safety net. Benefits, funded by the taxpayers now, not a charity, as in the food bank case. How many think that British taxpayers have an obligation to provide benefits only to British citizens, not to other people? Raise your hand if you think that. That the British taxpayer has an obligation to provide benefits for poor Britons, but not others. And how many think the British taxpayer has an obligation to provide income support to anyone, let's say, who finds himself or herself in Britain, regardless of that person's citizenship status, or for that matter, legal status. They are there, they are in need. How many think that? I can report to, for our listeners that the, the majority on the stage say uh, the second, and also quite a number in the audience at St. Paul's. Who disagrees? Who thinks that the eligibility for benefits from income support should go only to British citizens, not any, anyone who happens to be in need. Yes. Hi, my name's uh, Hamad. Um, I don't disagree with the point wholeheartedly, but I would contest the notion somewhat. Just as you would not begrudge a mother for feeding her child first, as compared to uh, a stranger's child, right. you should not begrudge the state for, uh, or even the British taxpayer for wanting their um, for wanting their tax to be directed first and foremost to the legitimate citizens of Britain. So you're you're drawing on the analogy of the family, sure. yeah. and what about the argument that the relevant family here is the family of humankind? I, th I talk about well, I mean that is a a very lovely and almost idealistic notion, but I would, I, would, I would pose that up to the question of whether that fits with practicability. I mean, if we, if we concede that we have a, a notion of a global citizenship, are we not saying that, well, the, the, the states that do exist at present are, what, in some way irrelevant? No, we, we accept that they are relevant in the sense that concepts such as citizenship do exist for the exact purposes of protecting those domiciled within a particular state. And so with that, with that practical side considered, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that a, a state has a, a prerogative to place their citizens first and foremost uh, as a priority. What do you say? Hi, my name's Park. I think part of the problem uh, with some of the discussion has been that we're really taking for granted our definition of the state and of citizenship, and we're also not considering um, the ethics of migration that are playing into this kind of thing. We, we need to consider whether or not the state does in fact have a right to exclude and does in fact have a right to exclude certain people from citizenship. And what do you think about that? I think the state, uh, well, I mean, I have worries about the legitimacy of the state anyway, um, but I don't think that we should, I don't think we have a moral right to exclude others from participation in the state or from physically being here. And I think that plays into some of these arguments. So you think, morally speaking, it's wrong to have restrictions of any kind on immigration. There should yeah. be open borders, morally speaking. Yeah. And holding that position, you would say that the benefits should, how did you vote on the benefits question? I, I voted they should go to everyone, not just British citizens. So, so you, and what's your name? Puck. 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 So you hold a thoroughgoing universalist idea about borders 
citizenship and benefits. Yeah. And what about, what do you say, Puck, to the arguments we've heard voiced that within a family, surely a parent has a right in it, it may be an obligation to give special concern to his or her child? Don't, do, you, do you disagree with that? Yeah. Uh, you do disagree I, I, with that? <laughs> um, partly in virtue of the business I hold on that, I feel like I am somewhat committed to actually take that strong stance and say that you don't have, I, I don't see, I mean, I have problems with the family as a concept anyway. I think we should sort of critically reevaluate how it factors into our society. And I worry about the family being used as an analogy with the state. But I do think that we have obligations. I do think we have high obligations to every individual. Um, I don't think it's that we have lesser obligations to people overall. But I don't think it's right to, um, to value the, the family as being the ultimate decider in who your obligations are to. So I want to bring Ahmad back in, who raised just now the example of the family. It, both of you stand up so that you can address one another. <laughs> now, now, Ahmad, you just heard mm -hmm. Pak say that even a parent favoring his or her needy child over somebody else's needy child is, in effect, a kind of prejudice. It's a morally illegitimate prejudice, right, Pak? Okay, yeah. What, what do you say? Uh, it's, Address, I, can, address. I can definitely see the perspective being brought forward, but I think that that puts us at odds with, that puts morality and biology at odds almost, because we have an inherent affinity to our own family. Our, our mother has an inherent affinity to her own child. She will, I mean, it's evident in animals, it's evident in humankind that a mother will protect her children for the most part, even to her death, even uh, place the child's um, survival and well-being over her own. And so to deny that for, for a universal notion of, uh, equal, uh, of placing everyone at equal footing whilst it sounds absolutely wonderful on paper is, I'd say, at odds with our very nature. I'd be very reluctant to take a reductionist stance and try and reduce morality to biology. I think there's plenty of things that we see in human society that just simply can't be reduced to biology. And I, I see your point about instincts and that kind of thing, but I'm also very cautious of reducing my moral stances to my emotional instincts. And I think that we should be, whilst they can inform where our sort of preferences tend to lie, I don't think we should use them to do our moral world building. And, and notice, Park extends this from families to the nation, whose borders she considers morally arbitrary. Am I right? What do you say to that? But I think there'd be a lot more, or I would argue, I think there's an argument to be made for the productivity and progress of a nation that, that uh, displays self-determination. And what I mean to say by this is that if a nation concedes that it has pride and a priority for its own citizens and a, a, a national sentiment towards the progress of itself. And if that, if that sentiment, rather than a universal acceptance of everybody being on an equal footing, if uh, actually the converse sentiment of a sense of uh, self-determination and pride is instilled within nations throughout the world, well, then we will see progress throughout the world. To, to the, contra the contrary stance to that is, well, if we have open borders and uh, everybody on equal footing, well, we know that evil exists. We know that uh, those with ill intent exist. We know that regimes that are oppressive on people do exist even in today's, even in today's world. And so to, to concede that uh, everybody is on an equal footing would be turning a blind eye to the realities of the world. All right, but I want, to, I want to take up your point. You, you speak of pride, mm. Ahmed, mm. and self-determination. Mm. Do you think we need a sense of belonging to a particular place, to a country, or, or to a family, in order to give expression to pride and self-determination? Uh, very much so. Not to say that that should prejudice you to, the, um, to uh, any other nation, but you should at least have that innate desire to want to progress your own nation. Fuck. So I still take issue with the idea that the nation state as it exists is something that, that should always exist as it does. And I think just because something is the way it is, I don't want to make like the is to ought fallacy, basically. I th I'm worried about taking something from the way it has been and saying, oh, well, it should always be like that. I also think I take issue with, I think, to, to pretend even that the nation state or that, for instance, Britain represents all of its British citizens even, I think, is... Mm -hmm is a bit disingenuous because I think if you look at the, you know, the participation in politics, it, it is not representing the majority of people in this country. And I think we have to seriously consider like how states are actually representing the communities they claim to represent. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Olya, and I would like to add an extra layer to that about pride and self-determination. Um, would you say that nations that have this pride and self-determination, they might be more likely to offer help or aid or benefits to others because they have capacity to do so. So now we're talking uh, about a lens that's coming from the Western world who have the extra means to do so. And then in comparison, looking at other nations who cannot offer even help to their own people and provide benefits for their own citizens or they're oppressed. So it's the question of, is, are they self-determined or is it pride to offer it to others to show how wealth and how progressive you are? So if I, if I understand you, and tell me your name again. Olia. Olia, if I understand you, are you suggesting, building on Ahmed's invocation of pride and self-determination, that a sense of national pride and collective self-determination can actually contribute to greater sense of responsibility to help others in need? Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. You must be sympathetic to that thought. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yes, in the back. Yeah, um, to sort of follow, follow that up, um, I also think that the idea that we identify with other people is a basic precondition to us willing to express solidarity with people or to support people. Um, where we have any sort of large-scale redistribution between rich and poor, um, then that does actually rest on the idea that there's something shared in common and also in strong institutions, um, like, like trade unions, which, which again rest on attachment to a place or an industry or, or some sort of community. So I think the idea that we should be kind of universalize uh, everything and, and have obligations to everything undercuts any sort of support you could ever have to uh, redistribute uh, in that way. You think that redistribution and generosity presupposes solidarities of more particular kinds. But why? Uh, tell us your name. Uh, my name's Nick. Nick, um, why, why do you think, let me put the question again, yeah. why do you think, Nick, that generosity and the willingness to help those in need presupposes solidarity or loyalty to a particular group or identity such as a nation? Be because to do that, you require the support for, say, uh, people paying more taxes, which will go to universal services, uh, or, or to be redistributed in a way um, that will support other people, rather than people just seeing themselves as a sort of atomized individual floating in abstraction. Well, Park, those are fighting words. <laughs> atomized individuals floating in abstraction, Nick says will not be very generous types. What, how would you reply? So I would say that a lot of the work that is done um, actually does exist outside the state and does happen beyond the state. And I think solidarity is very often actually built um, very much against what the state would rather happen. I mean, if you look at work that happens with grassroots refugees groups, so for instance in uh, Lambeth is Lambeth Refugees Welcome, who have lobbied the council to provide, to welcome 23 refugee families into Lambeth and have helped provide houses and all this kind of thing for them. And that's been very much separate from the state. That's people grouping together in a community and taking action. And also examples of, for instance, how the LGBTQ plus community has organized within solidarity and has links with different groups. And, this kind of, I don't think that we should be relying upon the state to do the hard work for us, in a sense. And I think that often the state will actually push back against the harder work that needs doing. I want to turn in our audience in St. Paul's to David Goodhart, who has uh, distinguished between people from somewhere and people from anywhere. You've heard the debate that we've been having on the stage, and the debate has already identified two competing philosophical approaches to generosity, a willingness to help those in need. There's the view that says we need to think of ourselves as fellow human beings above all, in universal or cosmopolitan terms. And then we've heard from those who say, no, we need more particular identities and solidarities to prompt generosity. What do you think, 
How, how do you react to what you just heard? I think we have an extremely unrepresentative group of British people but, in this wonderful cathedral. But what um, do you think? But I want to know what you think. How do you evaluate I, these arguments? I, I, I'm, I'm a weak cosmopolitan in that I believe in the moral equality of all human beings, but I don't think we have the same obligation to all human beings. I think our obligations are primarily to our families and our friends that roll out from that to, to our neighbourhoods and, and our nations and then to all of humanity. The chari why, charity begins at home but doesn't end there, is how I would put it. And why do you think that we have stronger obligations to those closest to us than to those further away? Why do you think so? Uh, partly, as was said earlier, it's partly sort of you know, functional, biological, uh, but also, I think... But morally, for, why morally do we have a greater obligation to those closest to us? Well, I, I think for the world to work, we have to, we have to behave in that way. For the nation-state, the nation-state is the root, essentially, of our, of our freedoms, of our welfare, or all the things that we most want politically and morally in some ways, you know, democratic accountability, uh, redistribution between classes, regions, generations, and so on. This happens essentially at the level of the nation state. And if the nation state has no emotional support behind it, I mean, this is the point that Theresa May was making with her uh, citizens of nowhere. If it doesn't have the support, even of the, you know, of the, of the powerful and the influential and the rich, then it's, then it's diminished. And we're all diminished by that. Thank you for that. Yes. My name's Alex. I just wanted to go back on this point about the state. I mean, you said how it was in Lambeth Council they were able to house 23 families. Well, the state of Germany um, took in over a million refugees, and that came out of that collective sense. I'm not an expert, um, but I believe of guilt for how they treated um, the Jewish people before, and that only came out of that collective um, feeling of guilt that you get by being part of a broader community. You also talk about the is-ought distinction, an important one, I agree, but I mean, you have got to work with the way that things are, and if you don't appeal to what actually will motivate people, then you won't get the outcomes that you want. So both, both you, Alex, and David Goodhart just now, have pointed to what will actually motivate people. And you've both suggested that what motivates people begins, at least, with those closest to us. We care most about them. And so morally, we should build upon that de facto motivation. But morally speaking, is that a concession to prejudice, Alex? I don't think it's a concession to prejudice because I don't think it's necessarily prejudice to believe that you've got certain greater obligations to those that you identify more with. But okay, I have but often, why? Yeah. But tell well, us I mean, why. I've often wondered that when, when uh, reading your book because you would give the examples um, of, and say, well, which do you prefer? And, I'd, and so I'd like to throw the question back to you. Like, for example, you were giving the example of um, was uh, Israel helping the Jews in... Um, uh, was, where was, where Ethiopia. Was it? Correct. And, I, and then you said, so what, what do you think? And I'd like to throw that question back to you and say, well, what do you think? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> We're working our way towards some of these questions. What do you say? Um, uh, hi, my name's Nate. Um, I'm really troubled by um, sort of this acceptance of the nation state as a positive and good thing and a, a positive influence on the world. Um, fundamentally, in my view, the nation state is an oppressive concept um, in that um, by focusing your energy on only helping, uh, helping the select few that is within your nation state, you're ignoring uh, your obligation to everybody else. And what I would say is uh, about this concept of solidarity and um, our, our sort of willingness to help people coming from solidarity with that person is if you walked past a person on the street and they were dying, you wouldn't walk past them just because you don't know them and you have no personal desire to help them. You would help them because it's the right thing to do and it's the morally correct thing to do. And then I, following on from that, I would say, why would you wait until the point where they're dying before you're willing to help them? If you're able to help them at any point before that, you have a moral obligation to do that. And I think anything else is not, it's not actually, um, a willingness to help, it's self-gratification if the only people that you're willing to help are the people that you know and the people that you like. It's just about making yourself feel good, not about actually helping other people. It's, uh, what's your name again? Uh, Nate. Uh, Nate. I, I'm from the Young Greens. You're from? The Young Greens. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah. Nate, here, here's the question then. We commonly distinguish between benefits or income support 
for fellow citizens and humanitarian assistance or foreign aid for people in need who live elsewhere. Are you suggesting, Nate, that morally speaking, there is no real difference between the two? Um, yes, um, I do think there is a useful uh, distinction in that you give the money to the people who are um, closest to the people in need so that decisions can be made by those who know how that uh, money can be used. But there's not actually a moral distinction for the reason why you're supposed to help these people. Um, it's just a functional, uh, useful difference. So morally speaking, your obligation to help your needy child, let's say, is no different from your moral obligation to help a needy child in Bangladesh. Well, ab absolutely not. Uh, and you also have to think is um, like, how needy are they? Is your child needy because they need a new toy? And is that uh, Bangladesh? No, let's say, let's say they are comparably needy. Sure. Morally speaking, the obligation is the same. Yes. Who disagrees with Nate and can say why? Who disagrees with Nate on this? Yes. Hi, uh, Nate, my name is Joris. Um, I, to go into your example of uh, finding someone dying on the, on the street, I think in that particular example it's probably right, you have an obligation to help someone like that. But it's a balance of both severity and principle. So for instance, let's say there's someone on the street struggling from alcoholism who has a lot of problems, gets into poverty, or it's my own brother who's struggling from alcoholism and gets into poverty as well. First of all, I think um, I would help my brother just because I have a personal collection with him. But morally? And morally um, as well, because I believe that you have a particular um, obligation to care for your family in this regard. But that's what, well, that's what Nate rejects. How, yes, that is what Nate rejects, yes. So how, what's the basis of that special obligation? The basis of that special obligation, I mean, I, I know the, the point about biology has already been mentioned, um, but I think part of the obligation is about the effectiveness, because I would know my brother a lot better as well. So I would be in a lot better, I have a lot more information about my brother than I have about a guy in the street I don't know. So therefore that is a closer surrounding. You're in a better can, position to help. I'm in a better position but to help. But the moral claim on you is no different, or is it? I think the moral claim is different because the effectiveness is better anyway, so the difference I can make is greater. Yes. Hi, um, hi I'm Tamara. So um, uh, I wanted to agree with this point because I, I feel that if we think about social contract with, with relationship to what is citizenship, I feel that we can say that the, the unit of citizenship is a nation as, as, as a very basic unit is important because if you, if you have any kind of um, like disadvantage, then you can easily fall back to your nation. Whereas if we think in terms of like, um, like just getting rid of any kind of uh, unit of nation, then basically like everyone is so individualistic that you cannot really rely on anyone else. And I feel that if you have a nation behind your back, you can you can easily say that like you you can back up nation state with with this kind of social contract because then if you have any kind of problem, then people be, people of the nation can help you. Hi, my name is Drushti. Uh, and I most definitely reject uh, the idea of uh, nationality-based uh, welfare. How, um, and, I, uh, and let me ask, or let me pose these questions to students themselves. Uh, that how is it that you would identify groups in need? Uh, most people here are grad students. Would you call yourselves people in need of welfare? Or do you, like, would you find that you are often struggling with finances or it's a stress that you face on a regular basis? I think if you ask yourself that question, um, it'll go a long way in answering, um, 
you know, answering this dilemma as to, as to whether needs should be defined or prioritized on the basis of nationality, you know, so and if your, like, let's and say... Your answer, and your answer is? That, uh, no. Uh, it should not be. It should not be because, uh, let's say, lots of people here are, are coming to these countries to study in, uh, in the liberal democratic universities in these spaces to come and engage uh, and somehow collectively also progress, um, progress uh, like the common motives we have right. as mankind. But at the same time, you are paying these large sums of money, you are spending a large amount of your money in these same economies. Yeah. So does that not make you entitled right. to certain Thank welfare you. or certain benefits? Thank you for that. Uh, what about companies in hiring? We've been talking about giving help whether a food bank, a charity, or taxpayer-funded benefits. Are they, in, are they different in principle from foreign aid? What about companies hiring policies? Should British companies give preference in hiring to British workers? How many say yes? On the stage, only about half a dozen people say yes. In the audience in St. Paul's, how many people say yes? British companies should give preference in hiring to British workers. How many say yes? Very few hands are going up. How many say no? That companies should hire without regard, British companies, without regard to national origin. Now, in St. Paul's, in the audience and on stage, a lot more people think they should not give preference. Why? Those of you who think they should, what would be your reason? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jake. I think there's something here to be said for like the principle of reciprocity and the idea of people who have given a lot to a certain sort of system of cooperation over a period of time tend to expect something in return for the fact that they've sacrificed themselves, so through the form of paying tax, by complying with laws, uh, etc. So I think that kind of idea under, like, kind of underpins a lot of sort of sentiment about why people should be sort of entitled to greater benefits by virtue of the fact that they have contributed to the system of cooperation to, to outsiders. They're, yeah. part of, they're part of a society. They're part of a society. A they've made contributions. A defined community that where certain people make contributions, yeah. And so they should, their fellow citizens have a special responsibility f yeah. for them, as do companies hiring in their Which country. Is quite a basic moral intuition, I think, the idea that if you give something, you deserve something in return. The idea of reciprocity yeah. over time within the framework of a community. Yeah. And it's Jake. Jake, what do you say? Hi, my name's Sam. Um, I think kind of ignoring even the kind of moral side of it is that the firms shouldn't have to argue about this kind of moral responsibility of the firm. Like a firm should uh, hire people based on how productive they're going to be for the firm, which will benefit society as a whole in general. And we go back to kind of the social contracts thing. The firm, by b being in the country, has entered into the social contract, which allows them to hire who they want, and their profits will circulate back. So even ignoring the morality, you know, you'd be a pretty awful firm if you only hired British people anyway, you know. What do you think? Hi, my name is Tija. I, um, when thinking about social contracts in this context, I think that a lot of this is about um, who is being allowed into this contract. And you know, more than half of the people who are unemployed in Britain, the young people unemployed in Britain at the moment, are from ethnic minority backgrounds. And is that all because they're not contributing to the economy in the same way? I don't think so. I think that a lot of that is because that the system is deeply entrenched in privilege. And but should, so how did you vote though on the hiring? The c British companies, should they hire British citizens, uh, give, a, give a preference in hiring to British citizens? No, I don't think so, because I think that even citizenship in, it, in itself is a privilege, and that our skills should be what foster our ability to be employed. Thank you, yes? Hi, um, I'm Sabrina, and I just think at this point I just wanted to bring luck into the debate, and I think it's relevant to um, the previous question about benefits and 
the question about um, hiring. And I just want to ask whether people think that um, the, your kind of social and biological um, characteristics of where you're born, um, over which you have no control or kind of don't des or desert, whether you think that that should determine whether or not you should receive any kind of assistance, how well your life should plan out, and what opportunities in life are available to you. And so you're suggesting, Sabrina, that if luck goes into who is a British citizen in the yeah, first exactly. place, yeah. then it's Th then why not it their be doing. Why should that be the basis for preference of any kind? Yeah, and, why sh and, and, on what ba and then how could that ever be fair? And how could that be fair? Is there someone on the stage who has an answer to Sabrina's question, who can explain? I wonder if I could turn to the audience, Jesse Norman. We'll get you the microphone. What do you, what do you say to Sabrina? You stand up so we can see, see you. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> What do I say, Serena, about, about luck? Or about what aspect of well, the what debate? Well, Sabrina is saying there should be no... British companies should not give hiring preference to British workers uh, because being a British citizen in the first place is a matter of luck. Why should that be the basis of any kind of moral preference, whether in hiring or whether in the receipt of benefits, or for that matter, help of any kind at the food bank. Are you, are you struck by the, the strong, I think it's fair to say, the pretty strong cosmopolitan universalistic conceptions of the common good that we've been hearing articulated thus far? I am struck by that. I would say that there are some big words we need to come back to. One of them was reciprocity. Another is giving uh, and the responsibilities that uh, go with receiving a gift and the sense of uh, duty that comes in a family from being the recipient of an inheritance and within a society for being the recipient of inheritance. And that feeling that people have that that binds them together and places them under a duty, under an obligation to pass something on to others uh, within that society. And therefore, the context we're talking of, of is not merely one of, of receipt and of right, but of duty and of obligation as well. And you, uh, you think there is something in the analogy that we've heard between duties associated with family membership and duties associated with national identity and citizenship. I think what is interesting about the analogy is that it forces us to ask the question, who are we? What is the we we're talking about? And is that the family? Is that uh, the community? Is that the nation? And does it go wider than that? And that's, it seems to me, the argument that you're really probing at all those levels. But the real question is, who is the we? And, and uh, for me, uh, inevitably, the we is about culture and uh, society as much as it is about economics and, uh, as it were, um, free trade. Well, do you mind staying there for a moment, Jesse, while I call on Pak and Sabrina together, who've, who've made this very strong case for a cosmopolitan ethic? And uh, the two of them, if the two of you would stand up, um, uh, speak directly to Jesse Norman and see if you can persuade him. Um, I think first, I, um, on, the, on the point of reciprocity and um, being able to, and, and kind of the mutual reciprocity between citizen and state, I think partly um, maybe you presume an ability to reciprocate in terms of access to employment, um, access to kind of ways to participate fully in society, which perhaps you presume the state provides. Um, and I'm not sure whether one, the state provides the opportunity to, for all to, to participate. And two, I'm not, very, I'm not sure whether kind of 
we need a certain um, baseline level of capabilities and resources to be able to actually uh, participate in this relationship of reciprocity. Park. So I would follow on from that point also in saying that it implies that you have some sort of choice in entering into this contract with the state, which I would say we, we don't. I mean, you can say, I mean, the, the alternative, of course, would be opting out and going and living in a cave. But So I think the state can have instrumental value, but I think that it does assume slightly that, that like the state is legitimate and that we've consented to be in a contract with it. And I think that the state can have obligations to you, but you don't necessarily have obligations to the state. And I'd also like to pick up on the culture point, um, because I think that's an interesting point in terms of, like, well, how do we define a we, how do we have a community, and then the, the impacts that has an individual identity. But I would say that I'd be particularly cautious of deferring to national identity and deferring to citizenship as being the marker of whether or not that's an identity you can be part of, especially when there are plenty of British citizens, like myself, that just simply don't identify with the concept of being British and who are not represented within mainstream British culture. Jesse? Gosh. Um, <laughs> so so um, I suppose my view would be very simple, which is, um, as a matter of fact, I do believe in a state that is positively empowering of people and uh, does uh, reach out to those who may be marginalized or disadvantaged and seek to give them the status and the dignity to be able to participate fully to the extent of their capabilities. So I fully, uh, I would, as it were, come back at uh, the first lady who spoke. O on the second one, uh, I must say I think that uh, whether or not we have chosen to be who we are, we are bound by an obligation that comes from having been the recipient of something extraordinary, which is the society we live in. And we may try to disavow that, but if we disavow it, then the question comes back, do you also disavow the obligations, the responsibilities that come with that society? And often you find that those who would disavow it uh, actually would like to embrace the uh, aspects of history that they wish uh, in that culture as well. I'm reminded listening to this debate of a passage from the 18th century philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau who said, do we want people to be virtuous? Let us begin then by making them love their country. But how can they love it if their country means nothing more to them than it does to foreigners, allotting to them only what it cannot refuse to anyone? That's an argument on your side of the position, Jesse, yes? I'd be extremely reluctant to be associated with an argument by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I, that, I, I wanted to make it difficult for you. Uh, well, thank he's you. An, he's an ally here, though. I'm grateful. Um, in very few things is Rousseau an ally. Um, m my view on this is that um, if he is promoting a decent awareness of commonality, then that is important, but in fact, in Rousseau's case, he is often taken to be promoting a general will which would obliterate some of the fine aspects of society that make it so valuable and worth living in. Thank you for that. Yes, um, back on the stage. Go ahead. I take a great issue with sort of how we've been talking about the obligations of people and obligations of the state to, for example, refugees. And instead of talking about, for example, also how refugees uh, not having citizenship status is the ultimate form of rightlessness. Not having any rights, not having citizenship effectively are the same thing. What kind of claims do they have? Instead of talking about obligations, how do we fulfill the claims that people have by the virtue of being humans, and not just humans, but humans who have been stripped of their rights altogether? All right, so that's an issue that arises with special force in the case of refugees. What about the obligations of the British companies? I don't want to leave that alone. Most people say, on the stage, most people say it's wrong for British companies to give preference in hiring to British workers. Who, who thinks it's all right for a British company to give preference to British workers? We've heard from, from Jake an argument to do with the reciprocity that arises when people participate over time in a community. So Jake has made that argument. Is there someone else who has an argument along these lines? Yes. Hi, I'm Scott. Um, I don't necessarily believe that it is right, but I can totally understand the, the economic argument that companies may choose to uh, employ mainly British workers, seeing as um, being a British person in Britain 
you have a higher likelihood of living in this country for a long period of time and giving back into the local economy. And so you allow a greater economic interest in the long term than you would by employing a foreign national. Yes. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I think there's an interesting um, geographical question behind this as well, because I think we're oftentimes thinking about skilled labor within Britain, but British companies resort to developing countries for the vast majority of the labor that actually powers the country's economies. So as a geographer who works in Bangladesh, looking at the garment industry, for example, you see the masses of people whose very inexpensive labor is what allows us to buy cheap goods, and yet they have no path to citizenship on the basis of their labor. But you're raising, you're raising an interesting challenge to those who say British companies should give preference to British workers. Are you suggesting that if one thinks that, then we have to call into question outsourcing? Correct. And what do you think? Do you think that companies that outsource labor to Bangladesh because it's cheaper the textile industry, for example. Is that wrong? Well, being an American um, with what's happening presently in my country about the idea of America first with a president who also outsourced labor for his own garment com company, and yet says, well, the reason I did this is because of international economics and because you know that's just the way the world works. Um, but I don't think that that's fate. I don't think it's destiny or needs to be that way. Um, there's certainly an argument to be made about having affordable clothing, but the average person perhaps who's shopping at a large, well-known, inexpensive retailer, you know, maybe there's other alternatives um, rather than relying just on cheap labor. Do you think that uh do you think it's patriotic, maybe even a patriotic duty, Rebecca, to, for British citizens to buy British produced goods or for Americans to buy American? Is that a patriotic obligation? It's not that so much as the idea of demanding fair wages that if they, you know, international labor is what's contributing to cheap goods here is to say that I'm willing to pay a higher price for goods that are made abroad to avoid child labor, for example. If, if global capitalism leads companies mm. to create factories in low-wage countries, say Bangladesh, does that suggest that capitalism is unpatriotic? I have many thoughts about capitalism, but perhaps we should turn to somebody else. What, who has a view about that? What do you think? Does, yes. I think by its very nature, like due to this um, accumulation by dispossession that knows no national borders, inherently in capitalism, capitalism doesn't want doesn't want to not know borders because opportunities to right. um, increase do not know borders. So. Capitalism, you said, doesn't want to know borders or to recognize them. Is that, I mean, is that a good thing about capitalism or a bad thing? Excuse me? Is that a good or a bad thing about capitalism, that it doesn't want to know or recognize borders? Morally good, morally bad? Yeah. It depends who is implicated, like who's... Like, the lives implicated within those borders, what, what those decisions implicate for, for people's lives. I'm We've been talking, though, about citizenship. Mm -hmm. National citizenship presupposes borders, knowing them, recognizing them, considering them to be morally relevant. If capitalism resists borders, or doesn't want to recognize borders, does that mean that corporations are citizens of nowhere? Yes, because it's profitable. And is that a good thing or a bad thing, that corporations be citizens of nowhere? 
I personally think it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. <laughs> and on the question of borders for the movement of people, we've been talking here about the movement of capital. You think that there should be restrictions on immigration because borders matter there too? But we cannot compare the movement of people fleeing injustice with the movement of capital, like looking to expand itself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Elizabeth. I would say that companies recognize borders when it's profitable for them. It's not about a moral question for them. It's if you look at the companies that build factories in the occupied territories in Palestine, it's not about um, a moral question for them. It's about what does or doesn't make them money. And what, how do you think it should be? How do you think companies should conduct themselves? Should they give preference to, in hiring to citizens of their own country? No. They shouldn't? No. They should be citizens of nowhere, companies, um, ideally. Yes, but my, my point is, is that they aren't acting morally, they're acting where the profit is. Back to Jake. Sorry, Alex. Alex. Um, I think it's morally fantastic that capitalism doesn't pay much attention to borders. I mean, I grew up in Singapore. It's a country that's got rich on providing cheap exports, and it enables people um, all across the world, millions of them, hundreds of millions in China, um, for example, to get rich and lead lives that they couldn't have imagined before. So I think often it's a bit parochial to say, well, is this bad for us? I mean, we need to look at the bigger picture and see how beneficial it is to other people as well. And also, I'd say that... Uh, it's kind of difficult to pin it on the system. I mean, it, because what, uh, the decisions that people make about what to buy in capitalism are their own. So if everyone wants to buy British, say, then they could within the capitalist system. But as a whole, people chasing whatever's cheapest, I think, has done wonders for uh, Asia, where I grew up. So I'm in favor. You're in favor. I, I, we've been talking about special obligations to citizens of one's own country whether with a charitable food bank or benefits funded by taxpayers or the conduct of companies in hiring. And lurking in this discussion just beneath the surface are competing conceptions of what community means. Is the highest moral community, the community of humankind, undifferentiated by family or neighborhood or nation? Or are there meaningful sources of community that should matter morally that are short of, our, of humanity as such? I'd like to come at this from a different direction by asking a, how how our students on the stage identify themselves. And I would like to ask, put the question in the following way. Would you agree or disagree with the following statement? I have more in common with other students in my university, regardless of nationality, than I do with people in the place where I grew up. How many agree with that statement? How many disagree with that statement? Here we have more or less an even distribution of opinion. Now, what I'd like to get at is the moral status of the commonality you feel, whether with your fellow university students or the people in the places with whom you grew up. So let's see who agrees and who disagrees with this question, the normative question. In an ideal world, we would think of ourselves not as British or French or German or Chinese, but simply as fellow human beings. How many agree? How many disagree? Here we have a roughly even 
distribution, but I think the majority in favor of the universal cosmopolitan view. And what about in the audience? In response to that statement, how many agree that in an ideal world we would think of ourselves not as British or French or German or Chinese, but simply as fellow human beings? How many agree with that? And how many disagree? The majority in St. Paul's Cathedral agree, but a substantial minority disagree. Of those who, I want to hear from someone who disagrees here on the stage. Why do you disagree with that statement? Why is that not the ideal? Tell us your name. So I'm Tyler, and I'm a pretty committed cosmopolitan, but, but I'm a cosmopolitan not on the basis of stripping everyone of their identities, but on the basis of acknowledging the, the, those identities and also acknowledging respons responsibility across places of origin and uh, ethnicity, nation, etc. So you believe these more particular identities are essential components of the kind of cosmopolitan ethic you would favor? Yep. What do you say? I think the question of like you know, a more localized identity is incredibly important. To use the university example, I have more in common, I think, with the people I grew up with from my city because we have a common shared experience that's rooted in a sense of place. What I have in common with people who I go to university with is that we will likely have the same socioeconomic background upon graduation. We will probably go into sort of graduate white collar jobs. I don't want my bonds between people around me to be mediated by what class I am in terms of capital. I want it to be something more than that, mediated by a sense of place and belonging. And I get that from the town city I grew up in, which is Liverpool, far more than I do than the fact that I happen to be you know, thrown into my university. And I'm you know, a cosmopolitan guy who loves my university. But I don't want my bonds to be mediated by capital. I think the discussion we've had says that you know, I don't think most people in this audience do want bonds to be mediated by capital. And yet, the meaningful sense of place we get from you know, where we grew up or ideas of nations seems to be resisted. And I think those two ideas are actually in conflict with each other. And what's your name? Peter. Peter. And where did you grow up, Peter? Liverpool. And why do you think your identity with the place where you grew up and the people you knew there, why do you think that that's a more important source of your identity than the people, the, the, than the profession you may enter into? Because a, there's, there's just the fact that, you know, I was there at the most formative time of my life. But I think beyond that, people from Liverpool, we have a specific accent. We, you know, we, 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 we all know the same parts of, you know, the city that are fun to drink in. We, we, we you know, we have, you know, we, we listen to the same music. We all sort of grow up with the Beatles and these cultural touchstones and these, you know, these ideas of self and place come from that, and that's far more important than the, you know, to me than the, you know, the, the profession you end up in. What do you say? I just like to. Um, uh, my name's Jacqueline. I just like to add to that. I think that the bonds that we we um, form with the people that we grow up with and with the communities, um, with the communities that we grow up in, they're not trivial. And I, I think that what you're talking about, um, growing up in Liverpool. I think that when we think about who we are and if we're closer to the people uh, that we go to school with, I mean, who are we as individuals, I think, comes from our values and where do those values come from? And I think, uh, at least for me, and maybe I'm flawed in thinking this, but I definitely think I share more with my faith community and with my community back home than with a broad array of the, you know, the international student body that, that is at the campus that I go to. Yes. I think it's like a really tricky question because of course like in our identity there's both like our interests that in a way draw do us to the university we go to but also like the self identity of the place you grew up in and as an Italian especially like I I feel it really strongly um but the, the I would like to kind of reflect on the university as a place and I think that the most important thing is the mixture between these two things, that in a way 
helps and encourage intercultural communication because the university like can actually help to make different cultures and different like voices kind of like melt together and mix together in order to in a way create something new and something interesting among these different cultures that in a way like get together and can really like in a way explain the, 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 the complexity of our world. And so how did you vote on, on whether the ideal world is one where we overcome these national differences? I think that I, I, voted, I, I voted for like in a way overcome the national differences, but I think that in order to overcome the national differences, sh there should be like a mixture of, of different experiences and different culture and different backgrounds. Yes. Hi, my name is Jason. Um, I think in an ideal world, we should not think of, and I, I, do, I do not agree that an ideal world should be one that everyone is seen as equal. Uh, or have equal interests or everything's equal. I think that in an ideal world, basically because we are human, we have um, intrinsically different um, values, different um, interests, different preferences. It is, it is um, natural to evolve into different groups or even, even nationality, if you believe. So I think that in an ideal world, there would be a uh, loss of different groups of people and the community itself is equally important in the sense that we allow people of different preferences to get together or from other um, natural preferences that we would need as a human being. So I think that would be something that I would um, uphold. I want to turn to Bishop Graham Tomlin. You've been listening to this discussion. I'd be interested to know in, in general what you make of it, but especially on one of the philosophical and perhaps even theological conceptions that seem to be at stake here. When there, we've heard many articulate the view that the ideal we should aim at is to overcome the particular ties or sense of belonging, some might even say prejudice, associated with particular identities, including national identities. Whereas others have been making the argument that we need particular communities, that they are not mere prejudices, that they're analogous, some say, to the family, that they should be affirmed, whether for reasons of reciprocity or rooted identities, we're edging up to the big question about whether the common good ideally is universal or whether the common good is irreducibly plural and particularist. What do you think? I think it's been a fascinating debate to listen to those two different perspectives that have come through in so many different, different ways. And I guess the debate really has been around these, the local and the universal and how we value the local and how we value the universal. And uh, I guess one question that's come to me as, we've, as I've been listening is that old statement that it's, it's often easier to love humanity than to love your neighbor. That in general, it's easier to love the human race, but actually in religious terms as a Christian, you know, I hear the words of Jesus saying, your call is to love your neighbor. In other words, the thing about neighbors is you don't choose your neighbor. It's the person who happens to be in front of you. You think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's the story of the person who is in the street in front of you, and the two religious people pass by, and it's the Samaritan who stops and actually helps. And um, so, you know, in, so it, with that in, in mind, I mean, just thinking about the local and the universal, excuse me, why the local is, is important is because... Could, could I just ask you yeah. first, why is it, do you think, harder to love the neighbor than to love humanity. Why is that? Because your neighbor is often difficult. <laughs> <laughs> your neighbor is not always easy to love. And, but that's the person right next to you. It's the person in the desk next to you at work. It's the, desk, it's the person who lives in the house next door to you. It's the person who you meet at the bus stop every day. And that's not someone you, you choose. 
And it seems to me that the, the importance of the local and that commitment to a local community, whatever that may be, it may be a family, it may be a neighborhood, it may be a city, it may be whatever, you know, that's quite important, partly because variety and diversity is good. We don't want everything to be exactly the same, everybody to be exactly the same. But also because it seems to me that those kind of commitments that we have over a long period of time to the same group of people actually cultivate virtues that make society work better. If, you're, if you have to try and keep on loving the same group of people over a period of time, it cultivates patience and forgiveness and honesty and the ability to be a little bit humble because you kind of make mistakes and you get things right and so on. And it's that sort of development of virtue that enables a society to work. At the same time, we need the universal as well. If all we have is mere locality, mere difference, then we're locked into, it seems to me, an essentially conflictual view of the world where if everything is just difference and there is no commonality, no kind of unity to any sense of what it means to be the human race, then before we begin to you know, end up with a view of the world where we're almost inevitably going to be in conflict with one another because we don't have any common mm -hmm. uh, identity and value. So I, I think that you know, we need both the local and the universal, and that's what's, been, what's come out of this debate. As you've been working with the communities affected by Grenfell, yeah. Which of these ethics, if we can call them that, have you found to be the most powerful? It's very fascinating that I think both of them have come out very strongly. It's a, the Grenfell community in North Kensington is a very, very diverse community, ethnically, religiously. It's a very religious community in many ways. Uh, it's very, very diverse. And, uh, in a sense, what's actually been su surprising out of that is, be is that out of those diversities, you get this kind of deep Islamic community in that area, you get sort of deep Christian communities there, you get some secular communities as well. And you've had those, and out of those sort of moral visions, out of those uh, particular communities, that I think over time have cultivated uh, these ways of life, these virtues, have come, uh, kind of coming together to support that community at the same, same time. And uh, I think Grenfell, in its origins, was a kind of failure to listen to our neighbor. It was a failure to listen to the cries of people who really needed the help of the wider community. Uh, but also, uh, it's been kind of the local communities, it's been the kind of neighborhood associations, it's been the, the, the churches, the mosques, uh, are the very ones that have come forward to support that community. Yes. Thank you for that. I'd like to see if some of the students would like to respond to what you've said. Hi, uh, my name's Kartik. Um, I think there's, a, there's like a fundamental difference between our obligations to people who we really know, like our family and our friends and people who are in our immediate neighborhood, and then the obligations to this kind of imagined community that's like Britain. It, Britain is, consists of 60 million people, most of whom I'll never meet in my life. I mean, I can see why I would have obligations to the people I meet every day or the people who I'll meet regularly in my community, my friends, my family. I don't see that that means I have to accept that I have obligations to all the 60 million people of Britain who I'll never meet, over and above the obligations I have to all of humanity who I'll never meet. Yes. Uh, toward the back, yes. I'm Tom. Um, I think we've discussed a lot today about the nation state and these abstract ideas of Britain and countries. And we actually haven't discussed as much um, of what the bishop was raising about local communities and local actors. And actually, when you go out into the country, you see that people that are doing the most work in um, community and local bodies are volunteers. Um, local people in your churches, your community groups, WIs, those kind of things. That is where most of the time and the effort is being put into supporting local communities and local people. And I think that's something that we've kind of missed today, um, is actually that a lot of the stuff that is done is, n is not this abstract national level. It's people on the ground, both in the UK and uh, around the world, aid, aid um, organisations and non-state actors and individuals. And do you, do you, how did you vote on the question? Tell, first, tell me your name again. Tom. Tom, how did you vote on the question of whether in an ideal world we would overcome differences of nationality, or for that matter, of faith, and simply think of one another as human beings? How did you vote on that? Um, I voted that we can overcome that, but I think, I think there's kind of both. 
that you can have both, that you can be British and also recognize solidarity with people across the world. You can have solidarity locally and internationally at the same time, and there doesn't need to be a one or the other. Yes. Hello, my name is Joshua, and uh, I just wanted to start by saying I think it's only appropriate in St. Paul's Cathedral that we brought in a religious perspective, so thank you, Bishop, for your words. Um, I myself also am a believer and a follower of Christ, and I think one of the challenges I have in this conversation is identity, right? So my citizenship, where is my citizenship founded? Is it rooted in a nation state? Uh, is it rooted in my identity and my belief in God? Um, is it rooted in my role as a husband and the different you know, functionalities that I play? Um, and I think one of the things I appreciated about, it was Tom, right, your last perspective, um, I was thinking about the local concept is, idealistically, we all would view ourselves as human. We treat all as equal. Um, but the challenge is that right now, where am I currently placed? And I'm currently placed in London, right? So if I'm here in London, why not do my best to have an influence in the space that I've been given in the current moment? And I think if we all thought that way, um, it would make the world a little bit smaller in that sense. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Christine. Well, I think ideally the idea of national identity should be dissolved because, like to me, ident identity is a very fluid concept. So it depends on where you are at the moment and like um, your interactions with other people. Like for example, well, I'm from Hong Kong, so I have a Hong Kong identity. But at the same time, I study here, so I identify myself as a student studying in the UK. And so, and especially because identity is so fluid and it would changes over time with your um, experience. That's why I think um, actually if you just anchor your identity on a nation, is it will create many problems because it's like, the idea of nation itself is like, it's related to power, like power dynamics or discourse whatsoever. But like at the same time, like, um, national identity is also important or like when we were discussing whether mm -hmm. companies should employ British citizens or like um, welfare is an issue between like private and public interests. Right. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Hi, my name is Toppy. Um, I think I have an interesting perspective on this debate because I didn't become a British citizen in, until 2007 when I was nine. And to say that on an arbitrary day before the state's obligations to me or my obligations to the other 60 million people in this country suddenly changed is to say that I entered into some sort of moral contract with people at the age of nine, which doesn't seem to make too much sense, you know? I think that, coming back to the point about locality, it's all well and good to say that, you know, you don't choose your neighbors um, and that you owe something to the people who are around you every single day. But I think that takes a slightly anachronistic view of what we mean when we say local. I think when we say that our obligations are the people closest to us, when I'm talking about family, I think that ignores a lot of people, for example, again, like me, whose families do not live close to them. Um, only my brother lives in this country. The rest of my family are spread all over the globe. I think lots of people would agree that I still have an obligation to that family over and above what I would have to a British citizen, you know, over what I would, above what I would have to Theresa May, for example. Um, so how do we reconcile that in this debate? How do we say, you know, we want to protect who's nearest to us, we want to protect who's British, you want to protect all those people who we see and meet every day, but at the same time we want to uh, unfurl the carpet of generosity and of provision based on need. In my perspective, I think, going back to the very, very first question, you know, ich muss essen is I must eat, whether it's from a German citizen, whether it's from a refugee, who matter, no matter who it is, you know. I'm training to be a doctor and I'm training to work in the NHS where care is delivered based on clinical need. And I think when we talk about giving things to people or, or hiring people, all these sorts of deciding upon who should receive and who should we deny. I think that the premise of who needs most is an infallible one, including when we need, talk about... So need in the case of medical care should be the primary factor in allocating medical care. Need. Yes, and I did actually want to bring up the fact that that's no longer the case in this country, that 
in the 23rd of October in 2017, new regulations came into force, meaning that hospitals are now obliged to make sure that everyone using the NHS has British residency, that they have a British passport. And obviously that's led to a lot of racial profiling because how do you decide who to ask, right? Who looks British? How do we decide who is we? And let me ask you, let me ask you, that, and tell me your name again. I'm Toppy. Tom. Toppy. Top. Toppy. Toppy. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. You're training to be a doctor. I am. When you become a doctor, will you feel, uh, you're, and you're, you became a British citizen at age nine, you mm -hmm. said. Do you feel a special obligation to practice medicine in Britain? Not for the fact that it is Britain, no. And, and why is that? I would much prefer to work in a system that provides socialized medicine. Um, for all my complaints about the NHS, we are very lucky to have it. We are very yeah. lucky to work in a system where... Yeah. No? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank okay. you. <laughs> cool. Um, sure. I think, you know, I would feel rather differently about being a doctor in the US, for example, or for other countries where medicine isn't provided in quite the same way it is mm -hmm. here. Good. All right. Th thank you for that. We, I want to put... I want to put a quote from a, an Enlightenment philosopher to our students on the stage and to our audience in St. Paul. The way the Enlightenment philosopher responded a little bit before the fact to Theresa May's conception of citizenship. Here's what Montesquieu said about the questions we've been debating. If I knew something useful to me but prejudicial to my family, I would reject it from my soul. If I knew something useful to my family but not to my country, I would try to forget it. If I knew something useful to my country but prejudicial to Europe, or useful to Europe but prejudicial to humankind, I would regard it as a crime because I am a person before I am a Frenchman, or rather I am necessarily a person while I am a Frenchman only by chance. Was he right? How many agree with Montesquieu on that? How many agree on the stage? A lot of hands are going up. How many disagree? A fewer number of hands. Why do you disagree? Why is Montesquieu wrong? Um, I'm uh, an American, and so my American identity is, uh, is important to me. Um, and I think that uh, there's a value to uh, the nation state, and that the purpose of the nation state is to serve uh, the people who are most in need, um, and that the nation state can protect um, vulnerable populations, and that there's value in difference <clears throat> and diversity of opinion. And that uh, I voted as well to uh, the opposite on uh, the previous question, which was that in the ideal world, uh, are we all sort of one monolithic human uh, sort of identity? Um, and I think that uh, there's a value to local communities because local communities create diversity of values, which creates a stronger human bond. Thank you. What do you think? Well, I think the various uh, dynamics that were described in that quote between uh, nation between, and Europe, and also between the individual and the family, are actually very interesting. It sort of answers the question. Whence do the nation state actually come? We've heard a lot of quite interesting and intriguing talk about this establishing the idea of the nation state. But in a sense, it's a corollary of the very more much fundamental ideas of human affinity. It's born out of the family that went to the tribes. And without going too much into the anthropology of it, I think if we're trying to disestablish that, we are working to an extent against the idea of human affinity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something to be cautious about. Yes. I think the one thing is identity, which is undeniable, but the other thing is fairness and how the state treat with fairness everyone. And I don't think identity is a cause for, for equal treatment for the state. I mean, yes. Hi, my name's Tom. A lot of the things we've been discussing, discussing have been predicated on the idea of need. 
And I think we came back to that with Toppy talking about being a doctor. And I wonder how far need can be contextualized. I think if we look historically, we could say that need does have a contextual basis. For instance, we have a sort of need for cleanliness today that was perhaps not a need but I want in to the stick Middle with Ages. The, I want to stick with the passage, the, the moral oh, the claim of Montesquieu. We've covered the issue of need. Who, who agrees with him? Who agrees with him? Yes. It's Oliva, right? Oliva, you agree with Montesquieu. My name is Ute. Ute, yeah. So I agree with it because the way I understood is that we can have our identity, but if we do harm to another level, we retract from the decision or the action we have taken, right? So well, I think in a way, I hope I understood right, but if we today live in a globalized world, our actions go beyond where we live and beyond our national state, but we are still responsible for our actions. So that is why I think we need to not mutually exclude identity okay. as we have done it. Like, do we want to be local or do we want to be international? I think that is not really possible. Yes. Um, I, there's been a lot of talk about identity and that being rooted in uh, your national identity. And I think what we need, also need to remember is not everybody identifies with their national identity. Uh, uh, I live in a country that uh, voted for Theresa May and voted for David Cameron twice, that voted for Brexit and would probably legalize the death penalty if they could. I find all of those things abhorrent. I, wait, 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 I, but I, I want your view on, on Montesquieu's philosophy that universal identities are higher than particular identities. What do you think? Sure. And, um, yes? I, I, I find, yes? Well, because of all of those things, I find... Um, people in Europe much more in common than what I find with people in my country often because I find many of the things that my country has decided to do abhorrent. Yes. I, I think that, it, uh, my name's Zach, by the way, uh, I think that both in the discussion we've been having tonight and in Montesquieu's quote, we've seen basically a number of monolithic identities or monolithic ideas, monolithic blocks, and there hasn't been enough of a discussion about how these ideas or these identities evolve with time. So if I could possibly pause it, there's been this focus so far on the state in particular and our loyalty uh, to the state and morality is flowing either from that or in rejecting that. Can we imagine for a second the state as being a norm and norms evolve through time? Let's look at the dimension of time here for a second. So if it evolves through time and morality is achieved through the pursuit and achievement of peace and or order, then there are a couple of things we need to know. Norms need to be buttressed and reinforced to a certain extent, but at the same time, norms need to be flexible enough in order to evolve. Okay. So, right now that means we need to have some sort of identity related to the state and some sort of loyalty and inculcate that, but at the same time, be flexible enough to create a more globalized world. Thank you. Montesquieu's idea that universal loyalties and allegiances are higher morally than more particular ones. Park? So I think we have to remember that we're considering, mo considering moral ideas here. So when, when you endorse a cosmopolitan universalist idea, you're not necessarily saying that identities wouldn't exist. You're saying that we shouldn't base our moral judgments on things which are arbitrary. So that's, that's what the quote is getting at. So we should base things on necessary conditions, which is that we are all people. And we, if you take a rights-based approach, you have rights in virtue of being persons that should be not eroded or changed based on your identity, which isn't to say that identity wouldn't be a big part of the individual, but that we shouldn't use that to make decisions. But I also want to say that I want to be cautious of taking a very ahistorical approach on things like that. So I do think there's, you know, particularly with the history of colonialism, patriarchy, that kind of thing, we should be aware of these things when dealing with the needs of others. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm Timothy. And to add on this, I'd like to say that um, our world today is very different than uh, the Enlightenment's world in that there is the um, ecological catastrophe, and that calls for cooperation and to precisely overcome this kind of realistic understanding of the world where <clears throat> we are competing against others or uh, referring ourselves uh, to um, uh, bounded communities. So if we are to survive, um, we need precisely to refer to this shared uh, fate that, uh, that we do have. Yes. 
I also think it comes down to the way we affect things. Even if we place universal goods above local ones, so we agree that universal goods are things like food and clothing and shelter and all the rest of it, the way you can affect that tends to be at the local level. The institutions that can actually affect these moral goods, that can provide the things that we morally would like them to provide, these are primarily going to be local institutions based around this sense of place and belonging in a local area, be that a city, a town, or a country. And I think that's... You know, we can all agree that the common good is universal. We want universal things to happen to, you know, we want good things to happen to everyone. But I think the way we affect that is through this idea of locality. All right. Well, we've, we've heard some powerful arguments for universal or cosmopolitan conceptions of identity and community. And we've heard little less frequently on this stage, but powerfully nonetheless, Arguments that more particular identities and forms of community, including families and nations, in localities, neighborhoods, matter morally and are not just a matter of prejudice to be overcome. I've been pressed, I think, by Alex and for, to, to say what I think. I'd start with that passage from Montesquieu we've been discussing. One of the logical implications of that universalist or cosmopolitan ethic of Montesquieu's is that it's not so easy to account for the moral weight, never mind of fellow citizens in the nation state, but to account for friends. If our encompassing loyal loyalties should always take precedence over our more local or particular ones, then perhaps the distinction even between friends and strangers should ideally be overcome. Montesquieu doesn't shrink from this radical conclusion. A truly virtuous man, he wrote, would come to the aid of the most distant stranger as quickly as to his own friend. And then he adds, if men were perfectly virtuous, they wouldn't have friends. It's a striking concession. It's difficult, it seems to me, to imagine a world in which we were all so virtuous that we had no friends, only a universal disposition to friendliness. The problem, it seems to me, is not that such a world would be difficult to bring about, but that it would be difficult to recognize as a human world. The love of humanity is a noble sentiment, but most of the time we live our lives by smaller solidarities. Now, this may reflect certain limits to the bounds of moral sympathy, but more important, it reflects the fact that we learn to love humanity, not in general, but through its particular expressions. To affirm is morally relevant to particular communities that locate us in the world, from neighborhoods to nations, isn't to say that we owe nothing to persons as persons as fellow human beings. At their best, local solidarities gesture beyond themselves toward broader horizons of moral concern, including the horizon of our common humanity. But as we've seen in the politics of the day, the backlash against decades of globalization that seemed to consign national identities and allegiances to the dustbin of history, as, we, as we've seen in the backlash against this tendency, people people won't pledge allegiance to vast and distant entities 
whatever their importance, unless they feel those institutions are somehow connected to political arrangements that reflect the identity of the participants. We're seeing that today. We're seeing that in the reassertion in many places around the world of nationalism with a vengeance. All this brings us back to citizenship and the common good. The global media and markets that shape our lives seem to beckon us to a world beyond boundaries and belonging. But the civic resources we need to master these forces, or at least to contend with them, are still to be found in the places and stories, the, the memories and meanings, the incidents and identities that locate us in the world, that give our lives their moral particularity. We've heard discussion here earlier in the debate about pride and self-determination. How can that be cultivated and sustained without particular places and allegiances? And it's true, since the days of Aristotle's polis, the civic tradition has viewed self-government as an activity rooted in a particular place, a city, or a locality, or a nation. An activity carried out by citizens loyal to that place and the way of life it embodies. Now, today it's different. Self-government today requires a politics that plays itself out in a multiplicity of settings. We've heard that emphasized repeatedly in our debate today. From neighborhoods to nations to the world, as a whole, and so the civic virtue distinctive to our time, I suppose, is the capacity to negotiate our way among these sometimes overlapping, sometimes conflicting obligations. And it's also the ability to live with the tension to which these multiple loyalties give rise. But to do this requires a morally more engaged debate about community and citizenship and the common good than the kind to which we have become accustomed. It requires the kind of debate that we've begun, at least, thanks to the students on this stage today. And so, to our participants and audience here in St. Paul's Cathedral and to our listeners, thank you for joining me for this episode of the public philosopher.